meant first giving honor to God as the center of my life. I thank God for Pastor for the opportunity to stand before you this morning. I also thank God for this beautiful woman to my left, my wife of over 27 years. God bless you, Kim. I love you. She loves me in spite of me. Praise God for that. Amen. Amen. And one question I always come back to in my life, in, this, in the world in which we live today, I seem to come back to this one question, and that is, how do those without Jesus Christ make it in the world today? Think about the turmoil we're experiencing, whether it be the political rhetoric, whether it's the economy, whatever it may be that's going on. How do those without a relationship with Jesus Christ, what do they do? We know that Jesus Christ is, for us as believers in Jesus Christ, that he sustains us, that he guides us. It's not always going to be perfect. It's not always always going to be a smooth road. But that despite of what we are going through, that God loves us, God cares for us, and that God continues to grow us. And I thank God for that. Yet in our lives, I do find strength as we go through these seasons of life in the book of the Psalms. For the Psalms, I believe, contain really a lot of the life situations that we go through. And we can find a lot of peace and solace and guidance and direction in the book of Psalms. Yet when we look at our lives, many of us have hopes, dreams, and desires, things we'd like to accomplish, things we would like to do. But yet there are those times when those situations don't occur the way that we have planned. And then we suffer moments, periods in our lives of discouragement. We work hard on our jobs. We do what we think we're called to do. We put in a lot of effort, put in a lot of hours, and something happens and we get discouraged. We all at some point in our lives are going to experience discouragement. For I believe that discouragement is part of, of our lives. Discouragement can even eat a hole in our hearts as we think about the things we've gone through. We think we've done the right thing. We thought we served this person well. We thought we've loaded the dishwasher correctly. And we get discouraged. Amen? Amen, Amen lights. Discouragement even can make us want to quit and make us even want to give up. Now, these feelings of discouragement do not negate our salvation. Because once we've accepted Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Once you are saved, once you've accepted Jesus Christ, you're in the palm of his mighty hand, and no one and nothing can snatch you out. But yet, feelings of discouragement can make us feel like we are physically, mentally, and spiritually weakened as we go through periods of time of discouragement. But yet I believe that sometimes, sometimes in our lives, that some people believe that because they've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that they're not going to have to undergo periods of time of discouragement, periods of time of feeling lonely, periods of time where things aren't going out the way we thought. Because remember, when you look at two mountains, when you get from this, to go from this peak of a mountain to this peak of a mountain, you must go through a valley. And it's in those valley experiences where we can grow, we can develop, we can learn more about ourselves, more about the situation we're going through. They're not meant for us to not learn something when God takes us through valley experiences. We need to take the time we spend in the valley and learn and to grow. Because remember John 16, Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. You will have tribulation. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Because those valley experiences build our faith, they build our character, and they build our endurance. Now let me pause for a minute and offer this one disclaimer to you, and that is this. If you're suffering through issues of discouragement or depression in your life, I am not a mental health professional. If you are going through these situations in life, please seek out professional assistance. See your doctor. We have helplines you'll see on the screens before and after service that points you in direction with phone numbers where you can reach out, that someone is there willing to talk, someone is there willing to help you. Don't go through these situations by yourself. This morning, turn with me to Psalm 42. Psalm 42, as we look at 
a topic dealing with discouragement. Psalm 42, it reads as follows. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and Hermon from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me, hoping God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading of his holy word. Again, the title of the message today is Dealing with Discouragement. Dealing with Discouragement. A bit of background for you from Psalm 42 and 43. They were originally one psalm, but then when the Bible was developed, if you will, it was split into two different psalms, Psalm 42 and Psalm 43. This morning, we're going to focus on Psalm 42. And when you look at Psalm 42, you can see themes of depression, discouragement, persecution, all going on within this one psalm. But this morning, we're going to focus on the psalmist uh, as he writes about the discouragement that he is facing. In terms of authorship, scholars believe it could be David or a Levite. But yet they likely, they shy away from David being the author because in verse 6, there are geographical references to locations where likely David did not go. Whereas one of the roles of the Levites was leading the people into worship. And as we read, we read read where the Levite, the, the psalmist, is talking about the joy he experienced of leading the throngs to worship. So likely it's going to be a Levite who wrote this psalm. Yet this psalm is applicable to our lives today, although written thousands of years ago, it's applicable to our lives today because at some point in time, we're all going to experience feelings of discouragement. And like the psalmist, we sometimes will find ourselves timid and afraid in desert places, thirsty, saddened, in personal exile because of memories of better times with loved ones and friends. We're all going to experience times of discouragement. But yet, my friends, we can overcome discouragement. To that you said, preacher, how? And my response is, I'm glad you asked. I'm going to leave you with a few points uh, this morning. The first is, dealing with discouragement is to maintain your desire to be in God's presence. When we are discouraged, discouragement can influence our minds and how we think. It can impact our thoughts and our emotions. Now, sometimes we know why we are discouraged. We can find a trigger that has caused our discouragement. But sometimes we may not know that trigger that causes our discouragement. In those situations, we must remember that we must desire to be in God's presence. No matter how we may feel in terms of our emotions, how we may feel in terms of discouragement, desire to be in God's presence. That ancient monk, Brother Lawrence, wrote a book that came out after his death about the pra- titled The Practice of the Presence of God. In this, he describes how he chose everything he did in life and did everything he did 
as if you were in God's presence. Whether it was washing the dishes, whether it was vacuuming a floor, whether it was whatever he was doing, he practiced the presence of God. And he acted as if God was in his very presence, which he was. But if God were literally sitting right next to him, it's how he approached the task that he did every day. The psalmist in this psalm desires to be in the presence of the living God. Now notice the progression he takes in verse 2, where he says, My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When should I come and appear before God? He basically is saying, my soul, I'm thirsty like this deer that is thirsting for water. Finds the water, goes to the water brook, and, and quenches his thirst from the river brook. He's saying, my soul thirsts for God. I desire for the living God. And he asks, when shall I come and appear before God? He knows he feels this distance in his presence with God. And he's saying, I want God above all things. I don't just want God. I want the living God. I want to be in his presence. When will I return to the presence of God is what he's asking. He feels physically distant from God, mentally distant from God. And he longs to come back is what he's asking for. Now think about your life for a minute. Have you ever experienced being in God's presence? Whether in your prayer time, in your Bible reading time, that quiet time where you spend just you and God, of being in his presence. What did it feel like? What did it feel like? Did you want to leave it? Then think about your life. You're practicing the presence of God, you're in God's presence, but then you do something sinful and you feel like you're distant from God because of the sin in your life. And you can't come back together with God in his presence until you confess that sin. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's like plugging a cord into an outlet. We've got to make sure we've got a solid connection in order for us to have that, feel that, have that presence in that fellowship with God. Yet, the psalmist knows and feels that not being in God's presence leads him to weep. When you look even at verse 3, where he says, My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? He is so distant, he feels that his tears are his food. He's crying. He's weeping because he's desiring the presence of God. But yet what's going on with his, in his life is there are tormentors that are basically making fun of him. They're saying, you believe in God. You claim you're a Christian. Why are you going through this? If God loved you so much, he wouldn't put you through this. They're making fun of him. Where's your God in all of this? If somebody say that to you, where's your God in all of this? Well, my friend, God is still on the throne. And no matter what we go through, God is with us. We always have to remember, no matter what we go through, no matter where we find ourselves in life, that God is always with us. God has been with us forever and will remain with us forever. Those around us may torment us, but we know that we hold a firm foundation with God through Jesus Christ. My second point this morning is remember the past, but do not dwell on the past from verse 4. The psalmist in verse 4, he says, these things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with sh glad shouts and songs of praise and multitude keeping festival. Listen to that. These things I remember. He remembers the times when he would lead the people to worship and the joy they experienced as he led them in worship. He longs to go back. To, doing, to, to leading them in worship. He remembers the joy that people were feeling as he led them in worship. But yet as he pours out his soul, he talks to God. 
God, I long for you. I long, I know what I used to do, God, and I want to return to doing that again. Remembering things and reflecting is part of life. Kim and I often reflect back on when the kids were young and the things they did that made us laugh. Not that they don't make us laugh now, it's more tears, it's kidding, but um, we remember those things that they did as kids and it brings us great joy. And I remember still, but I don't dwell on those things. I don't treat them as if they're two or three. They're far, they're older now. And I remember back on April 16th, 1991, when I laid eyes on that woman for the first time. I don't dwell there. It's a remembrance in my mind of that beautiful experience that can never happen again and how much beauty she has exuded since then. And no, I'm not in trouble. It's just the memories we have in our lives that help us sustain and they also help us to remember who God is and how far he has brought us. It's allowing us to rejoice. And even as we transition in our lives in terms of caring for older parents, we have to remember, we remember them when they were young and they were able to do everything for us. And now it's time for us to return that to them and do things for them. We don't let that dwell in our mind. We use it as a period of rejoicing and rejoicing, saying, God, thank you that you've given me the opportunity to now return back to them what they gave me when I was growing up. Amen? And that's what the psalmist is longing for. The psalmist is like, God, I don't know when it's going to occur, but Lord, I know I'm going to go back and lead them into the throngs of worship once again. He has that memory in his mind. That memory sustains him. That memory continues and continues and gives him strength to continue on. And then my third point this morning is maintain hope. From verses 5 and part 6, part A. He asks himself, and this refrain is also found in verse 11 in Psalm 43, verse 5 also. He asks himself this question. He acknowledges his discouragement when he asks why his soul, in Hebrew, soul means his innermost being, why his innermost being is in turmoil, meaning why God is my innermost being experiencing despair and anxiety. God, why, is it, why am I going through this? These people are making fun of me. But God, why am I going through this? But yet, although he is discouraged, he reminds himself to hope in God. Look at his words. He says, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. By using the words, I shall again, that expresses his hope. That God, I know where I am right now and God, I have faith that I'm going to return there. And I have hope that I'm going to do this again. For I shall again expresses the hope that he has that God is going to bring him through this and lead him back to where he was doing what he was doing before. And he wants to encourage his readers and encourage us even to have hope in the midst of our circumstances and our discouragements in life. And I want to encourage you this morning that no matter what you're going through, have hope. Keep hope hope alive. Don't give up. Don't give in. Keep hope alive. Remember how far God has brought you. Remember where you were and look at where you are. And when you keep hoping in God, he's going to do great things with you in the future. My fourth point this morning is look beyond your present situation. In verses 1 to 5, the author focuses on his longing for God and uses the metaphor of thirst. In verses 6 to 11, he focuses on his remembrance of God and he actually uses geographical references to, 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 to portray the distance he feels between himself and God. He uses, he talks about Mount Hermon and Mount Mizar. Now, when we look at those mountains where the Joshua and Moses were, there's roughly 9,000 feet above sea level, whereas Mount Mazar was a lower hill. So he's saying, God, this literal geographical distance of 9,000 feet above sea level 
is how far I feel distant from you. Saying, God, I long to be in your presence is what he's saying here. And when we have felt God's presence and then not have it, we should long for it once again. But notice when we look at these verses, there's a shift in his countenance in verse, between verses 7 and 8. When he says in verse 7, deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls, all your breakers and your waves have gone over me. And then in verse 8, he says, by day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. Verse 7, he uses the metaphor of waterfalls and breakers that they have gone over him. He's saying, God, it's like a surfer in a surfing and the water goes over him. The breakers are going over him. He says, God, your omnipresence is with me even in the midst of these storms. And God, you will guide me through this. But then he turns in verse 8 and says, he reminds himself, by day the Lord commands his steadfast love and his night, at night his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. No matter whether it is day or whether it is night, God is with him. And God is with us. Even in your midnight hour, God is with you. God will never leave you. He loves you just that much. In the midst of discouragement, the, leader, the reader may not feel like God is there. But he is. In your midnight hour, when tears are your nourishment, when you're crying out in agony, putting your heart, laying your heart out to God, saying, God, I don't understand why I am discouraged. I don't understand why I'm going through what I'm going through. We must hope in God, trust in God, and realize that God will never leave us. Jesus and God will never leave us or forsake us. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere present at the same time. And yet in verses 9 and 10, we also see another shift in thought where the author in verses 9 and 10 then goes back and asks the question, why, one more time, where he says, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? He feels like God has forgotten him. In the midst of our discouragement, sometimes we may ask that question, God, it seems like you've forgotten me. What's going on, God? But God has not forgotten us. Remember, in any situation we face, that God has got a lesson he wants us to learn. And we've got to search, seek God and say, God, I know I'm in a situation. What is it that you want me to learn? Where you have me, you have me here for a purpose, for a reason. Show me, teach me what it is that you want me to learn from this. Because I want to grow, I want to be a better person coming out of this than I did, was going into this. But yet he still cries to God about the taunts of his adversaries. It's like they won't go away. They keep saying, where is your God in the midst of all this? And as I said, God is where God was when he started this. He's God. He's still God, and he will remain God forever and ever. And I'm thankful that he does not change. I'm thankful that he is God and God alone. And then when you look at verse 11, he repeats the refrain that he, refrain he said in verse 6, where he says, Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me, hoping God, for I, again, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Now look carefully at the ending, word, ending part of verse 11, which was also in verse 6. But he says, for I shall again praise him, meaning God, I know what I'm going through. I don't know why I'm going through, but I know, God, I will again one day return to praise you. But he says, my salvation and my God. Now, salvation in the Old Testament meant deliverance and or, or being saved from harm. He's saying, my God is my salvation. God, I know I feel distant from you. God, I'm being tormented. God, I'm being persecuted. But you are my God. And because you're my God, you are going to deliver me. You are going to give me salvation because you are my God. It is a personal thing he is able to remind himself. He knows that he is discouraged. Yes, he knows his enemies are taunting him. He knows that he is distant from God. But he also knows that God is his salvation. That God is his God. His personal God. And he will make it through. 
My friends, no matter our plight in life, no matter where you find yourself, remember that God is with you. Keep on praising God. Keep on praising God.